Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Honeywell. As Selena said, I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto. I do security consulting by day, and I'm one of the founders, current board member, and the sitting president of HackLab TO, Toronto's hackerspace. And my slides are auto advancing. Why is that? <laughs> oh dear. This is actually an Ignite talk. Yes, this is not supposed to be an Ignite talk. Oh goodness. This is, this is why you shouldn't use, even though it's not actually PowerPoint, it's open office, uh, you still shouldn't use it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, where was I? Oh, it's still auto advancing. Oh. What the heck? <laughs> this, is, this is not, oh, okay, I found it. There's, there are actually two settings, it turns out, for auto advancing. Do you want someone else to No. <laughs> I, I would really like to be in control of when my slides move forward. <laughs> Oh dear. So, what is a hackerspace? Hackerspaces have been around for thousands of years, as it turns out. Uh, we just used to call them blacksmiths, artist collectives, um, different kind of community centers. We had all sorts of different names for them. Hackerspaces are just the latest incarnation of this kind of community space. Um, we've come up with a bunch of different terms within the hackerspace community, a bunch of different sort of elevator pitches for what a hackerspace is. Um, one of the ones that I really like is calling it a library for stuff, you know, the place that you can go to to use the kinds of tools that you won't necessarily have either room or resources at home to have, you know, in your tiny apartment when you live downtown. Um, things like 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC mills, that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of connections between hackerspaces and the idea of sort of third space. Uh, a lot of hackerspaces are organized much like co-working spaces, though there's some substantial differences. But at its core, what a hackerspace is, is instead of hacking alone behind your laptop in your basement, you hack behind your laptop on a couch with a bunch of friends around. So that's sort of the, the main thing with hackerspaces is working collaboratively with people uh, on projects, on your own stuff, just having a bunch of people around that you can work with that are like-minded and have similar interests and divergent interests because that's where a lot of the interesting stuff comes from. Um, I think one thing that'll sort of resonate with people is uh, you know how unconferences are supposed to be all hallways? Well, hackerspaces are like permanent hallways. The, uh, that sort of energy that you get from talking to people, from mingling, from interacting, from bouncing ideas off of people in the hallways of a conference, that's, that's a lot of what you get out of participating in a hackerspace. Um, these are some pictures from uh, the largest hacker conference in Germany, the Chaos Communications Congress, um, which is held every year between Christmas and New Year's. They're going into their 27th year next year, I believe. So hackerspaces um, around the world have sort of different ideological and historical origins. Um, in North America, you've got things like the Tech Model Railroad Club at MIT, you've got ham radio clubs, you've got Toastmasters, you've got other sorts of community groups like the Rotary Club, the, the Lions, that kind of thing. And before the 2007 rush that I'll talk about a few slides down, there, uh, there were a number of spaces around North America that were hugely influential. Um, in terms of influencing how hackerspaces eventually developed in the United States and Canada. Uh, you had the Loft in Box Boston, New Hack City in San Francisco, and a number of other spaces around the world. In, uh, in Europe, hackerspaces have a 25-year-plus history um, and have tended to be a lot more political, both in terms of their origins and the activities that they've participated in. Many hackerspaces in Europe grew out of the squatters' rights movements, um, anarchism and different political movements like that. Uh, and this has led to some really challenging sort of conflicts between conflicts and discussions and that kind of thing on various international mailing lists between participants in some of the European hackerspaces and some of the North American hackerspaces and other places in the world. Um, so when I say it's an international community, it's, it's a really international community, and there, it turns out there are a lot of these spaces either currently operating or in progress. Um, the last count on the wiki that I checked was around 400, but there's no way to count it, um, so, and I hadn't bothered you know, writing a script to count it for me. So uh, there's, there's a lot of hackerspaces out there. Um, again, in Germany, where there's this 25-year history of hackerspaces, 
Um, many of them are affiliated with the Chaos Computer Club, who are the ones that put on the Chaos Communications Congress, in case you hadn't had in enough C words already this morning. Um, they, uh, they're, a lot of them are loosely affiliated with this club, and there's lots of independent ones as well. Um, but uh, they have a history of like significant political involvement and sort of participation in the public discourse. They publish a, I believe, quarterly magazine that has 4,000 subscribers. And uh, they have been heavily involved in resisting um, the push towards biometric ID in Germany, including a couple of years ago, they, uh, they lifted the fingerprint off of a glass at a conference the glass belonged to the equivalent of the Homeland Security Minister in Germany. And they published this fingerprint in uh, their magazine. So 4,000 people had a plastic foil that you could use to impersonate this fellow if he went ahead with all of his plans to like, rah, 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 biometrics everywhere, you know, this is the future, not so much. So that, that actually like significantly derailed the push towards biometrics uh, in Germany. Um, so. These are a couple of pictures from uh, Seabase and C4, which are two hackerspaces in Germany. So there's this secret history to Berlin that not a lot of people know. There's actually a spaceship buried under Berlin. The only two places that the spaceship sticks out above ground are the TV tower, the famous like iconic TV tower in Berlin, and the sea base. So if you go into the sea base, there's, it's all this sort of alien spaceship theme, and there's you know walls covered in old motherboards, and it's a really really neat space. And they support themselves almost entirely on beer sales. They throw a lot of parties. <laughs> it's it's a fantastic venue. If you're ever in Berlin, I totally recommend paying them a visit. So what happened in 2007? We had hackers on a plane. Uh, this fellow named Nick Farr, uh, originally from the New York area, now living in DC, um, organized a wild trip from DEF CON in Las Vegas, Nevada, where 32 of us flew from DEF CON all the way to Dusseldorf, and then there were some, some all sorts of crazy organizational stuff where we were supposed to fly from Dusseldorf to Berlin, but somebody put, booked the charter plane for the wrong day. So it was a total adventure, right? It ended up being hackers on planes, trains, and automobiles mm -hmm. instead of just hackers on a plane. All, all told, all 32 of us got from Vegas to Berlin and safely back to North America. Um, but a number of folks, uh, to go to this event called the Chaos Communications Camp, um, every four years, the CCC puts on a camping event um, now imagine you have 1,700 hackers camping in a field with like, it, it was a decommissioned um, German military base. So there were like, it, that was now a uh, airport museum, like airplane museum. So there were all these fighter jets all over the place lit up with lasers and all of the talks were in bomb hardened bunkers. And also there were all sorts of hijinks including we water ballooned some of the speakers and there was, uh, the Italians had an ARP spoofing party, which was, they, they had been in trouble in previous years for doing all this ARP spoofing and otherwise like jinxing the network. And so they decided at, at the CCC to confine their ARP spoofing activities to one particular evening where they, they screwed around with the network and you could go and drink with them while they were screwing with the network. Um, so after Hackers on a Plane, uh, a number of the folks that came over from North America stayed for a couple of, I think about two additional weeks and toured around visiting a number of the hackerspaces all over Europe. There were about 10 people who stayed on and did this little tour. And this got people incredibly enthusiastic about starting hackerspaces, about participating in hackerspaces. And the, the slogan, build, unite, multiply, came out of that. Um, and there ended up being a lot of talking. People, it, people ended up getting sick of there being hackerspaces talks at hacker cons. It was like, oh, not another how to start a hackerspace talk, which is why I'm not talking about how to start a hackerspace today. <laughs> but uh, at the same time as there was a lot of talking, there was also a lot of doing. Now, granted, there were plenty of false starts. Who here has, has started, had a big idea for an open source project and put up a wiki and a mailing list and all the infrastructure and then like never written more than a couple dozen lines? Okay, I'm not the only one, good. <laughs> so this is a known problem, right? Same kind of deal with hackerspaces. People would throw up a mailing list and get all excited and then you know three people would come out to the meetings and they wouldn't get enough funding together to put up a space. Um, but at the same time as there was this sort of like false starts, a ton of spaces were actually getting started um, all over North America. There was a real resurgence between 2007 and 2009, just spaces multiplying all over the place. 
Um, we, we basically stopped running out of excuses for starting spaces. It's like if the Germans can have had spaces for 25 years, where the heck have we been? So this was, who here was in, on Usenet in September 1993, right? So for, for those who are like my generation and actually have only read about this, this was uh, when few people had real internet access, every September you'd get this like rush of newbies who got access at school and everybody would be like, oh, it's September again on Usenet, oh no. Um, well, that was a normal September. September 1993 was when AOL got Usenet access, and then September never ended. So September, to, September 1993 for hackerspaces was actually uh, probably like December 2007 for us, uh, but it's, it's sort of been ongoing. So people who'd been running hackerspaces started to get all these emails from people, hey, I want to start a hackerspace. What should I do? So. That's where hackerspaces.org comes in. Hackerspaces.org was founded by a bunch of folks from Vienna's MetaLab hackerspace. Um, now, I was saying that European hackerspaces have come out of you know, anarchism and the squatters' rights movement and all these political movements. Some of them have. Some other spaces, even like whatever ideology they've come from, a number of European hackerspaces are very, like, really organized. They have, you know, government funding, grants for their location that pays the rent. They get funding to do educational programs. So Vienna's MetaLab is actually considered a youth center. So they get a ton of funding to, to rent this beautiful space in the museum court, quarter in, uh, in Vienna. I haven't sadly actually visited them, but I've seen a lot of pictures of their space and it's amazing. So anyway, folks from Vienna's Meta Lab uh, started hackerspaces.org and it's become this like internationally supported, internationally used website um, that provides mailing lists, which sometimes get heated again with those like across the pond political conflicts. Um, there's a, an excellent wiki that has uh, the semantic um, wiki plugin for MediaWiki that lets you organize tables by values and that kind of thing, which is good when you're talking about tables that contain 400 hacker spaces, right? Uh, there's a, a, a Jabber server, um, an IRC channel, and there's a monthly VoIP call-in that lets hacker spaces around the world chat each other up, maintain you know ties between the different spa spaces around the world, and otherwise just sort of keep in touch, keep inspired by each other's projects, and, and just chill out. Um, probably the most important function of hackerspaces.org has been, I live in Detroit, and I want to start a hackerspace. I'm going to go to hackerspaces.org and search for Detroit, and if nobody's started one yet, I will put my name down. I'll set up a Google group, I'll set up a mailing list, whatever. And then the next person who comes along and says, I live in Detroit, I want to start a hackerspace, will be able to get in touch with me so you don't get this sort of um, disparate people duplicating labor and uh, not being able to find each other. There's like one central community run resource where people can say, I live here, I want to start this kind of project. Um, and I know from talking to a number of people around the world that have been in the process of starting hackerspaces that that's been really, really valuable. Some of the other documentation that came out of that 2007 to 2009 rush um, was the hackerspace design patterns. Uh, the folks from C4, which is a hack another hackerspace in Germany, produced this document. It's a you know 70 slide or whatever PDF that they gave as a presentation at the 24 or 25 C3, the Chaos, Com Communi Chaos Communications Congress. Too many C words. Um, so this was, you know, these are design patterns. These aren't sort of prescriptive, this is how you have to do it. It's more, these are the things that have worked for us. Here are some easy answers for the questions that you're gonna run into. Um, they uh, include things like, don't fight about what day to meet, just meet every Tuesday, <laughs> right? And you'd be amazed at just what percentage of hackerspaces around the world actually meet on Tuesdays. It's, it's not trivial. Um, don't let people sleep there, a hackerspace is not a hostel. That's one that's sort of tricky um, when people end up hacking all night, so it ends up being don't sleep there too often. Um, don't bother with plants, they will die. This is one that has totally, totally proven true from everyone that, I've got one of those little solar powered flappy plants, I don't know if anybody's seen those. I've been meaning to add one to the hackerspace because you know, a little bit of green would be nice, but anything more, anything that isn't electrically operated, totally gonna die. <laughs> Um, standard communication channels for hackerspaces around the world, mailing list, IRC channel, and wiki. Uh, I'll get a little bit more into the wiki later, but if you go to hackerspaces.org slash wiki slash capital D documentation, that's where all of the, uh, that's where the 
design patterns are, as well as links to things like uh, corporate bylaws. A lot of hackerspaces in the states are incorporating as 501c3 charities. Um, so there's a bunch of information there about how to do that. Uh, I know we linked our bylaws from there at HackLabTO as well. And a number of spaces around the world have provided resources like that. Here's how we've done it. Take what, what you will from it. Here's some design patterns. So these are, these are some of the ways that people started to run out of excuses. Um, we, had, we had a talk at the Last Hope, which ended up not being the Last Hope. There's a Next Hope this summer. Anyway, <laughs> so at the Last Hope in 2008, we had, a, we had a panel discussion. I think I had a picture from it earlier that was the panel with a bunch of people on it um, called Build Hacker Spaces Everywhere, Your Excuses Are Invalid. That was actually the, the talk title of the panel. So we came up with a bunch of the common excuses. I live in a small town, there aren't enough people. Things like that that people had run into in terms of trying to start hacker spaces and tried to break down why none of those are really excuses, why they're all, they're all things that you can get past. Um, and it turned out that people really did run out of excuses. People really did sort of get past these objections and start founding hackerspaces all over North America. 2008 saw just a real, like that's when Hack, Hack Lab TO was founded. That's when I think all of the other Canadian hackerspaces except DIYOD in Guelph. Um, there's about 10 or 15 in Canada and there's, there's dozen, literally dozens in the United States. Um, so a couple of examples of hackerspaces. In uh, Kansas City, we have the Cowtown Computer Congress. Again, with the C words, <laughs> they, they are actually in a mine. Apparently, you can get really, really cheap rental space in mines in Kansas. Um, and uh, they, they have had a bunch of really cool contests. They were the ones that pioneered fundraising by raffle. They had a huge raffle and raised thousands and thousands of dollars uh, to fund getting their initial space. In Washington, D.C., we have Hack D.C., which is hosted in a church. Uh, it's co-located with a number of other community spaces. I believe they actually just moved to a bigger space a couple of months ago. I don't know if there's any Hack DC members in the room, but uh, they, they moved, I'm pretty sure they moved to a bigger space a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and uh, they've also been rewiring this, you know, 150-year-old church with Ethernet, and they're doing some community wireless stuff as well. But they've they've really been working with all of the other community groups that are hosted in this this church. Um, to improve their like technological capacity and have really been giving back to the community in some amazing ways. And of course, near and dear to my heart, we have Hack Lab TO in Toronto. This is a shot of our couches. We've since reconfigured and painted one of the walls with uh, chalkboard paint and the, the books have moved around and all sorts of stuff. But uh, we were founded in July 2008. We're now up to 35 members. Our break even is like 30 members, so we're sort of comfortably not losing money every month, which is really nice for my pocketbook and other people's pocketbooks. Um, we have an 800 square feet space, so it's pretty, in the relative scheme of hacker spaces, I mean, Noisebridge has got what, like 2,000 square feet? Hack Lab TO is pretty damn small, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's cozy, and uh, it's ended up that, you know, other, other hacker spaces in Toronto are getting off the ground where they wanted more room to have industrial equipment and other big machinery where the biggest thing we have is our laser cutter, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. So um, we have a pretty typical funding structure in terms of how we run the organization. Uh, we charge 50 bucks a month for 24 seven access. That there is a picture of our RFID key system. So the little, the little gray box is an RFID reader and every member has an RFID card that they can use to get into the lab. Except we all know RFID is horribly insecure, right? Everybody knows this? Anyway, that RFID system, super insecure. So we have two-factor authentication because if one part of your system isn't secure, you should add another factor. And you know, at least if somebody spoofs your RFID, they'll have to know the password as well. So we have a pin-based lock as well to add to the security of our system. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we have um, our organizational channels again with the wiki, the mailing list, and the IRC channel. Most hacker spaces use Freenode because you've got enough infrastructure to manage. So why run an IRC server? Um, this this is I, I think pretty pretty universal. I, I I don't off the top of my head know of any hacker spaces that aren't using Freenode for IRC. I'm sure there are. I just don't know of any. Um, we have a blog that is very infrequently updated because people are too busy hacking on stuff to actually write about the stuff they're hacking on, which makes me kind of sad sometimes, and they'll sometimes poke people, hey, that project that you're working on, can you go write it up on the blog? Um, but uh, 
Yeah, one of the things about how we run our sort of internal communications, um, we have, our wiki is actually private. It's not sort of public to the entire internet because if you think about it, there's sort of two ways of thinking about a wiki and a hacker space. You either have, and this is, I give Eric from HackerBot Labs credit for this, but you can either have the internet extending into your hacker space or your hacker space extending into the internet. So in the case of a private wiki, it's sort of your hackerspace having a little tiny footprint in the internet, but not letting the internet into your hackerspace. Um, and it, it allows for people to, to put sort of rougher ideas than they might necessarily feel comfortable putting on a public wiki. So you, we have things like to-do lists, uh, a roster of member information that includes you know, people's phone numbers and stuff so that if you need to get in touch with somebody, that information's all there, but it's only accessible to members. So that's, been, that's actually been really, really useful for us and a really good way of, uh, of communicating as a community because we're not just, it's not just the 35 members that make up the Hack Lab TO community. We also have probably 200 people on our discussion mailing, our just informal public discussion mailing list. Again, the archives to that are private so that people sort of feel comfortable and safe writing about crazy projects and plans on it. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how to do your communications, you know, what some of the pitfalls of things being public versus private are, and how, how we've done that. So thinking about not just the technological organization, but also the logistical organization of hackerspaces, um, there's a lot of similarities in the sort of hackerspace taxonomy to how open source projects are organized um, and free software projects. You've got different modes of organizations like the cabal, the nonprofit, the co-op, the for-profit, the benevolent dictator for life. That's, that's actually a pretty common model. It's the BDFL and the cabal. Um, we, Hack Lab TO is run as an incorporated nonprofit in the province of Ontario. Um, we haven't bothered with the whole charity thing. Uh, a lot of folks can end up writing off the, the hackerspace membership on their taxes anyway, even though we're not a charity because it's like a professional membership business expense kind of deal. Consult an, a, an accountant. I am not an accountant. I am not a lawyer. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Um, so, projects. It's hard to talk about hackerspace projects uh, in terms of what they're doing without talking about what hackerspaces are doing in free software and open source. Uh, because that's where so much of the interesting stuff that hackerspaces are doing is coming from. Um, at the Hack Lab, we have a bunch of projects. Not all of, not all of the ones I show here are open source, but the, the bacon sign uh, is actually a bunch of salvaged LED panels that uh, are running off an Arduino that's connected to a machine that runs our IRC bot as well, and you can use the IRC bot to send messages to the sign, and all of this stuff is freely available on GitHub. I'm missing a link, but that'll be in the final slides. The other two pictures there, we've done a lot of crafty projects. Um, I've taught a really large number of people how to sew at the Hack Lab. <laughs> I started on the, we have an open house every Tuesday night, and it's been getting really, really crowded the past couple of months. So instead of trying to work on something complicated like electronics, I started to bring in my mending. So I'd have you know socks that needed a, a hole darned or something, and people would be like, how do I do that? Oh my gosh. And people started bringing in their mending and it's really easy even in a noisy environment to, to do, you know, to, to sew up a hole in your socks. It's less easy to do soldering or um, work on software or whatever. So that ended up being sort of a thing where people would bring in their sewing projects on Tuesdays. Um, we also, the, the sketchy pile of cables there is, uh, trying to get a Lisp machine up and running. We were donated this ancient, uh, almost older than me, Lisp machine um, that had gone on all sorts of adventures. If you search, uh, there's a fellow in Toronto named Joey Davila, also known as Accordion Guy. Who here knows the Accordion Guy? I figured a few people would. If you search Joey's blog for the Lisp machine, you'll find some amazing stories of his deadbeat ex-housemate. Right, so the Lisp machine. Um, this was one of these sources of conflict in the lab where we had this amazing piece of technology that a bunch of people wanted to work on but didn't really know how to work on, and it was taking up space. And you know, we're, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna get it working, we're gonna get it working, we're gonna get it working. We ended up donating it to the, uh, the CS club at the University of Waterloo, where I expect it is also sitting unused and sort of forlorn, this sad piece of amazing technology that nobody can figure out how to get working. So uh, some other projects, <laughs> before I keep rambling about the Lisp machine. Um, <laughs> we have about five Roombas, I think. Only one of them is working right now, but there's been sort of this uh, treadmill of restoring the batteries in Roombas, and people will bring in their batteries and get them fixed, and then they'll live at the lab for a while, and people will take them home. And 
yeah, we have a lot of Roombas. Um, the picture that you see in the top middle there is our laser cutter. So the laser cutter. We decided fairly, fairly soon after starting the space that a couple of us really, really, really wanted to get a laser cutter. Um, you know, we'd used them at other spaces, we'd seen stuff that people had made with them. Uh, for, for those who don't know, what you can do with a laser cutter is cut things, you can also etch things, uh, you can also set things on fire, but we try to keep that to a minimum. So we got this laser cutter, one of the members found this laser cutter on Craigslist, it was $500. This is pretty cheap for a laser cutter, right? Even the like dodgy ones you buy on eBay, new, are about $6,000. So we get this $500 laser cutter. We don't know exactly what's wrong with it, but we know that the tube is good. And that's the important part of a laser cutter. It turns out all of the other stuff in a laser cutter is pretty simple, um, but it's you know intimidating if you, if you don't know what you're doing. Fortunately, we had a couple of people at the lab who, were, who really, really, really knew what they were doing and had done a ton of machine control stuff before. So uh, they actually rebuilt all of the electronics. I'm really sad I don't have a picture of it because it looks really badass. Um, they rebuilt all of the control electronics for this laser cutter and wrote software to a PIC microcontroller that allows our like dodgy laser cutter we bought off Craigslist to work perfectly with the uh, Linux LinuxCNC.org EMC software, it's the enhanced machine controller. Um, it runs this custom build of Ubuntu that you're not allowed to upgrade anything because they're running like custom kernels um, and to, to, to do machine control. And this uh, open source machine control software, uh, technically free software, machine control software, can be used to um, control all sorts of different CNC machines like mills and lathes. And it turns out laser cutters that people put together in a weekend. Amazing, right? So our, our code operates dangerous, dangerous 25 watt lasers. Now keep in mind that I said 25 watts, right? That laser, laser pointer that you use in your presentation, that's like one to five milliwatts, right? Let that sink in for a second. 25 watts is actually not that powerful, a laser cutter. Um, they, you, if you wanna cut metal, you go up to 200, 100 or 200 watts. Um, but our 25 watt laser is enough to get through a quarter inch acrylic, and you can make a lot of interesting projects with a quarter inch of acrylic. So, um, oh, and the last project that was sort of my, my baby at the lab was we had a, a Python class that was sort of a drop-in community, newbie-oriented Python programming class where People could show up, I've never programmed before, what do I do? Here's like, you know, the basics of what programming is taught with Python. And we used this wonderful book uh, called Python for Software Design, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist, that very, very, very gently, it's written for high school students, very gently introduces people to the core concepts of computer science through teaching Python. And uh, we had a, a fantastic time with that class for about a year before I totally burned out because I was doing it every week. It turns out, if you want to run a programming class, I highly recommend, and, and you want to do it every week, highly recommend having a second person that will like trade off responsibility for the class with you. Um, or if you want to just do it on your own, do it for a set term. Don't try to do it as an ongoing thing. It was really, really fun, but I totally burnt out on it. So uh, another free software project that's coming, coming soon from the Hack Lab, although there is actually code already available. Um, we, had this, uh, we had a member who brought in this thing that he built. It was an amazing piece of software that uh, you could view the logs of our RFID door system. You could access every Shoutcast stream on the entire internet. Uh, you could see the weather and it would pull in RSS headlines from a bunch of different sources, including The Onion, which led to sort of double takes. Is that a real, oh, it's The Onion. Um, so this, uh, this beautiful touchscreen app that we had was unfortunately written in VB6 and Flash and we didn't have the source code to it. So one of the members uh, a couple of months ago was like, I really like the hack touch but I'd really like to be able to change the RSS feeds and you know, fix the HTML sometimes displaying incorrectly out of the RSS feeds and all, all these little bugs and little things um, or you know, add more pictures to the database because only some of the members had their pictures associated with their, their entry log and some people had the wrong pictures because we'd reused keys as members had come and gone. Um, so Sarah M has been rewriting the, the hack touch in uh, Ruby uh, and it's available on GitHub if anyone's interested. I believe so far it can do shoutcast and display the weather, uh, but it will eventually also be able to dip into a database and display logs from, uh, well, presumably it's only gonna display logs from our system, but it's free software, you can change it. 
Um, so it's not just free software that's getting written at hackerspaces. It's also, there's a lot of free hardware projects coming out of hackerspaces. Um, there's, even just over the past couple of weeks, there's been a discussion on the hackerspaces.org mailing list about building an open source laser cutter. So we actually you know, did, did most of that at the Hack Lab, um, but people want to turn that into a big project and, and make it something that's commonly available. Um, it turns out the only complicated piece in the entire laser cutter that you pay $6,000 for at the low end, and you know, if you want to get one that's actually made in the United States, you're looking at ten dollars to $20,000. Um, it turns out the only complicated part in that whole arrangement is the laser. And you can get that on eBay too. So. <laughs> It, it kind of works out. So there's, there's that that's going on. Um, other stuff. Who here has heard of the Arduino microcontroller? I guess I should have asked who hasn't heard of the Arduino microcontroller. Okay, so the Arduino microcontroller didn't strictly come out of hackerspaces, but again with that whole like hackerspaces have existed for thousands of years thing, uh, it actually came out of uh, an art college in Italy um, where this professor wanted to be able to teach his students uh, basic programming in order to do uh, machine control, or create interactive digital objects and that kind of thing. So uh, he built this, um, prototyping board called the Arduino, integrated a USB port directly into it, uh, made it a lot easier to use, and sort of built this really friendly to use stack for doing physical computing and building hardware. Um, and I think they're selling 50,000 of them a year now, even though it's open source, it, probably because you know, it's, it's free hardware as well as free software. So there have been, a, there's a whole ecosystem of clone Arduinos that um, have, have forked the project and are available for different kinds of applications. So the one that you see there is the latest generation of the original Arduino Arduino, but there's also the lily pod that you can use to sew into clothing and make wearable digital art. Uh, there's the, there's a bunch of tiny little ones that will stick directly into your USB port. Um, there's all sorts of different sizes and configurations, whether you want to use it on a breadboard, wire it into something, um, and there's different variations which have more memory and that kind of thing. So the Arduino, again, while it didn't come strictly out of hackerspaces, is in really, really wide use. People teach classes in it at hackerspaces. It's, it's widely adopted. Um, and another project that actually did come out, like directly out of a hackerspace, uh, who hasn't heard of the, the MakerBot Cupcake CNC? Okay, so for you, and you haven't heard of it. Oh, you have, I asked if you hadn't. It's okay. So since it seems that most folks are familiar with it, it's a 3D printer, low cost, um, low accuracy, but that's not important. Uh, we call ours the breaker bot, but we love it dearly. Um, and that actually, that project came out of NYC Resistor in New York, where they sort of bootstrapped the business out of out of that hackerspace and now have, you know, like taken up over their own warehouse space, shipping facilities, they have all their own equipment, um, and they're, they're just taking over the world. So that's an exciting project that came out of hackerspaces. So all this, you know, all these fun projects aside, what do hackerspaces mean for free software? That's the core of what I came here to, to tell you about after all that long exposition. Hackerspaces are just another back channel. Um, hackerspaces are a place for people to collaborate on free software in a way that is potentially more high bandwidth than IRC or mailing lists or wikis. Um, but they're also, they also have the benefit of cross-pollination. Not everybody who is in your hackerspace is going to be a Rails, Rails girl or a Python guy or whatever. Um, so you'll, you'll get that sort of cross-pollination of, hey, I'm stuck on this. Does anybody have any ideas? And because there's that diversity of experience and interest, you might get an idea that you wouldn't have had in Pound Ruby on Rails or whatever. Um, and they're also frequently a, a space that small user groups congregate or sort of grow out of. Um, we, there, there are two Toronto Java users groups, um, one that's sort of corporate run uh, and I think has the official like Sun blessing for as long as Sun remains relevant in that space. Um, we also, some of the folks at the, hack, at the Hack Lab also started a second uh, Java users group, which is now actually grown out of the Hack Lab and meets elsewhere. But for about the first year, they met the fourth Thursday of the month. So the Python class that was also on Thursday would go to the coffee shop. Um, but really the key thing for me, for my participation in free software and for the participation of a number of the folks that I know has been this idea that you can show up at the, hack, at the hacker space with a question and somebody will, if not have the answer, have an idea of where to start. Um, and obviously, like high bandwidth communications don't work that well for everybody. 
uh, IRC channels, mailing lists, and wikis are never going to go the way of the dodo um, in terms of free software, I don't think. But hackerspaces are just another channel that you can use to collaborate on free software projects. We actually did a lot of our Google Summer of Code mentoring for the project that I worked with last year out of the Hack Lab. Uh, four of the five mentors uh, for our project were actually Hack Lab members and would, you know, we'd meet on a regular basis to check in on our students and that kind of thing. So challenges for hackerspace, hackerspaces that are relevant to the free software world. Um, it turns out that there's, this is actually where I found the most sort of common ground is the sort of institutional or organizational issues that hackerspaces have. Uh, a lot of them are very similar to the ones that, um, that free software projects have. Um, the, the big one, of course, is politics. You've got, <laughs> I wasn't going to be able to not crack up, sorry. <laughs> so um, like any free software project, um, there's a number of political issues that can, can bog down hackerspaces. Uh, many of them are pretty much exactly the same as the stuff you run into with free software. Uh, the big one that a lot of hackerspaces have found is that bootstrapping a business out of a hackerspace can, can be totally fraught with peril. Um, the MakerBot, Cupcake CNC, like MakerBot Industries, total success story there, but there are the, that, that particular road is littered with the bodies of hackerspaces and businesses. Um, so be careful, it's a community space, tread lightly on the toes of your neighbors, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of that comes down to resource usage being also sort of a, a potential source of conflict. Um, somebody wants to code, somebody wants to blow sh stuff up, somebody wants to use the solder station at the same time as another person, somebody wants to play music really loud and throw a party at the same time as there's a user group meeting. If, if you don't have sort of a, a space that has really good soundproofing in multiple rooms, you can end up running into to tricky conflicts there. Um, I, I actually don't know what the analogous conflict within free software communities would be, but it feels like there probably is one. Um, the, the other sort of meta ones are uh, who's in charge, where does the money come from? Free software projects don't have that much in terms of overhead for the most part. Some of them do, but, and, and that can cause conflicts, but hackerspaces, you know, you gotta pay the rent every month unless you're in Paris and actually squatting in an industrial building. But that aside, <laughs> there, there is a hackerspace in Paris that is a squat. Uh, so who's in charge and where does the money come from? These are things that you want to state explicitly. You want to set boundaries around in terms of working with your peers within the hackerspace. You don't want to just sort of hand wave and hope that it'll happen. You want to think these things through. Um, one of the big ones for us has been, uh, we actually have a sign on the back door of the space that says this way to the bike shed. <laughs> um, which is just a sort of reminder that, you know, that thread about how we're going to buy a projector does not need to be 400 messages long. It really was, it was kind of terrible. All of a sudden, the, you know, 10 messages a day mailing list went to 150 messages a day for a couple of days. And it was really all about buying a projector. So uh, we ended up buying a projector. It's very nice, it's all installed and it's lovely and people use it all the time and it's great. But sometimes it helps to shift where that conversation is happening. So if you're noticing a mailing list explosion, say, hey folks, let's table this to the next meeting or let's have a quick chat on IRC. And, or, or if something in a meeting is getting heated, hey, let's, let's, let's put this off to the mailing list. And it's not a question of, of just deferring it, it's, it's changing that mode of communication to one where the conflicts aren't necessarily gonna be less, but they're gonna be different, and maybe some of those communications issues are gonna get ironed out just by that shift in mode. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you get another giant thread on the IRC channel that you know, is scrolling so fast you can't keep up with it, but it, it has worked a bunch of times for us, so. Um, scaling your community. This one actually really hasn't been a problem for us, but I know it's been a problem for a, a number of spaces in the States. Once you've hit that sort of core group of founders, how do you keep reaching out to your community? How do you keep recruiting new people? And you're going to have people that are going to not use it as much as they expected and otherwise sort of drop off the map. Um, so there's that sort of constant outreach. How are you going to do that? How are you going to foster and encourage the community that you have? Um, and I, I, I don't know, who, who here reads Indexed? I, I love index. I, I just I like this one. So, and how do we get new blood? How do we recruit the next generation of hackers, the next generation of free software developers? Um, this is my friend's daughter. I'm sure that she is going to be programming before I'm done university. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, where do we outreach? Uh, I do a lot of work with going into high schools and telling people about you know, what I do working in information security. Um, I think there's a huge amount. Uh, 
teachers love having people come in and talk to their kids about what they're doing in the real world. So if you, if you do free software, whether it's for fun or for work, talk to your friendly neighborhood computer teacher who has you know, a bunch of unruly 15-year-olds who really, really want to hear about what you're doing. It turns out that they're, they're really bored a lot of the time and, and would love to. I, I will say, though, it, 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 I have it a little bit easier doing information security, because uh, as soon as you break out the lock picks in front of a bunch of 15-year-olds, they're just like, and, and you have their attention for the next hour. I'm just like, OK, first I'm going to do a demo. Tick. And then they're like, it, it's pretty awesome. So. When it comes to hackerspaces, I really feel like the future's already here. It's just une unevenly distributed. Um, uh, about 15 years ago, there was a book that came out called Bowling Alone. It was talking about the decline in civic life in North America. And uh, I don't know, hackerspaces give me a lot of hope that, that, that civic life is not declining, that you know, we still have the ability to create community spaces and, and real life communities. Uh, in as much as I, you know, I'm of the generation where I think that virtual communities are also valid, real life communities have their own benefits. So that's that. Um, thanks for listening. <laughs> Do we have any time for questions? Awesome. So yeah, if there's any questions, how to start a hackerspace, organizational issues. Um, I don't know where the code for our laser cutter is, but I really should get it online. Any questions, takers? Reed, did you raise your hand or were you just yawning? <laughs> Anybody, questions? Oh, surely one question. Two over here. So the question was, how do I feel about engaging non-technical people in the space? Um, that's actually one of my favorite things. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time encouraging artists and musicians and people who wouldn't necessarily think that they, that they can sit down and make LEDs blink with a microcontroller to come in and hang out and see what we're doing and talk about what their ideas are and figure out how, that they, how they can accomplish them. Um, we've had a number of people show up over the past few months who have crazy ideas of adaptive technologies or um, other sort of technological ideas that they, that, that they really, really want to accomplish and don't know how. We had a, a couple of weeks ago a fellow showed up who um, his son had been injured in an accident and was a paraplegic, and he was helping, he was building a, uh, he took a simple, an electronic Simple Simon game, and he was trying to convert it to use conductive fabric and thread so that the kid could play it with his fingertips as he regained mobility in his hand. And uh, he got it working within about an hour of showing up at the space. So little things like that where we can engage people who aren't necessarily technical from the start um, to work on cool projects and shiny things. That's, uh, that's really, really important to me. And I know it's really important to other people at the space. Yeah. Um, so uh, I know there's a, a big variety. One of the, the, the challenges of, of, of these spaces is actually how do you come to a decision? Right? How, uh, how do you, who should make that decision, what mm -hmm. the process is? And I wonder if you could talk a bit about the variety of different ways people have worked out how to organize that kind of yeah. problem. So a lot of that comes from uh, what your organizational structure is. If you have a cabal or a benevolent dictator, that's where the buck stops most of the time. Um, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we have an official board of directors, but the board of directors tries to not interfere with the day-to-day -day decision making stuff at the space. Um, we we work on a modified consensus basis, so we try really, really hard to get consensus, but if it comes down to it, we'll do a vote. Um, I, I actually can't remember the last time we had to go to a vote, because the consensus stuff has been working pretty well. Um, we've had it pretty easy at, at Hack Lab. It's, it's been a pretty low conflict space in terms of organizational de decision making. Honestly, I think the biggest conflict was what projector to buy, which, which is, it's, it's a nice like, problem to have as our worst problem. Um, so yeah, a lot of that is going to descend from what kind of organizational model you use. I know Noisebridge in San Francisco um, has a bunch of stuff written into their bylaws that specifically delegates any, any real decision-making power out of the hands of the board of directors and into the hands of the members. Um, and I believe they also use a, a, a pure consensus-based decision-making model. So. Yeah. All right, any more questions? All right, thank you, Lee. Good.
feel free to uh, 